um, you know, for myself. Uh, gaming is very much a hobby, which became a career later on. Everyone got a pair of glasses? I hope so. Okay. If not, I'll have to mime the three. Okay, so uh, all kinds of titles for this presentation. When I read it on, on the app, it was described in one way, and actually I, I submitted it a different way, and the final title I went with was Touch and Go, Interacting with Stereoscopic 3D Video Games. So we'll have a vote at the end as to which title you like the best. Now, uh, as far as the agenda for today, uh, I'm going to be talking for the most part about traditional video games, video games that are, are here today on, on PC, console, and, and mobile. So, what are the key agendas? What are the requirements for effective video game interaction? How do people aim in real life? And how are games bridging the gap between life and virtual reality? And when I'm talking about virtual reality, I'm really talking about stereoscopic 3D gaming. And what do 3D display makers need to know? So once they, you know, once we know what we do about stereoscopic 3D video games, how can display manufacturers put out uh, better display so they're a good fit for video games. So let's talk about the must-have requirements for positive game interaction. By the way, I don't have this at home. I wish I did. Um, okay, so interaction requirements for video games. It has to be accurate. Very important. It has to be fast. And it has to be comfortable to use. Now, um, on the topic of accuracy and being fast, just the other day, I saw an interview with uh, John Carmack, who's the co-founder of ID Software, its software. And his work, or his company's work, is responsible literally for inventing the first-person shooter, the Wolfenstein 3D, the Doom series, the Quake series, Rage, and so on. He's really a top pioneer. And uh, I apologize for not having a slide for this, because I, I just saw it recently. He's working on a, releasing a head-mounted display Describing that, there are another manufacturer that no need to mention. They put out a head-mounted display, excellent resolution. Like they, they've really done some very big innovations when it comes to head-mounted displays for consumers. But they it had a latency problem, 50 milliseconds. That there's 50 milliseconds of latency between the image being put out by the computer and actually being displayed in the optics. So it, it's really incredible how, how a small amount of latency has a dramatic effect on a, a gamer's ability to interact and play video games. So this is very important. Now these needs, as far as accuracy, being fast and comfortable to use, apply to both PC as well as console video games and mobile 3D devices. And by the way, as mobile games develop and as the technology develops, we're going to see mobile taking a more active role, similar to the way PC and console does in the living room. We're already starting to see some of that today. Now, how do people aim in real life? So, uh, I'm going to get a little audience participation here. I'd like you all to clasp your hands together. I'm going to make a, a closed V. Clap your hands together and point it at the smiley face. Um, it, it doesn't matter which screen you use, one or the other. Okay? Now, I'd like you to close one eye at a time while you're holding your hands out. Now, uh, I'd like to see by a by show of hands, I'm going to have to go by uh, uh, the honor system here. How many of you see it like your hands are covering the smiley face with your right eye? So this is you know, so where your right eye seems to be aiming properly. And then how many is that your left eye is aiming properly? So here's an interesting fact. 80% of people are right eye dominant. So Regardless of what your left eye is seeing, it's the right eye that does the targeting. So with, even with both your eyes open, this dominance is, is, is very clear. So here's a, here's a trivia question for you. Uh, and this, I, by the way, it's not a trick question. I, I mean, I, I just, uh, do sniper rifle experts close one eye when they aim their gun? So let's say they, they have a rifle, there's a scope. Do they close their eye when, one eye when they're doing it? For, you know, for the best aim. How many people think that's the case? Okay. Okay. Well, the fact is they don't. The recommendation is actually to, to aim with your dominant eye through the scope, but your second eye triangulates. So 
even though the, the perspectives or the way the image looks, it's actually going to be radically different because one, of course, is zoomed in and the other one is just the traditional view. Um, both eyes are actually important in the aiming process, at least for, for the snipers. And by the way, it's amazing that this is the second time that this image came up. I didn't realize that people involved with the minority report would be here a little embarrassed. Um, <laughs> but nonetheless, so let's talk about the gamers in interface, who are also known as the tools of the trade. Well, first we've got the standard crosshair. Now this is the most important element in the majority of video games, whether it's first-person shooters, you know, if you're a gun or if you're a wizard and you've got a wand to point, it's all, they all use the same tool, which is the crosshair. And as I described earlier with, with John Carmack's remarks is, is that, you know, split-second reaction time is absolutely needed to win. When there's latency or there's a delay, this, is, this could become a very serious problem very quickly. <laughs> Next, we have the scope. Now this is a sample from, from Battlefield 3, which is the most recent uh, Battlefield 3 from game, sorry, Battlefield game from Electronic Arts, put out by DICE. Now, it, when you look through the scope, it should be a zoomed uh, view of the target being aimed at. But this is also applicable to simulators. Like for example, uh, if you're in a submarine simulator, uh, you can have a periscope. So it's a similar idea. And then you've got the mouse pointer. And this is extremely important. So if we look on the right hand side, this is an image capture, it's an older game called the Company of Heroes. And imagine, if you will, a 3D map where you've got to pick and choose your soldiers and your characters and move them from point A to point B, or you've got to select a group of buildings. This is all very important. It's, it, of course, it's important to have accuracy. So what happens when stereoscopic 3D isn't included in the game design? And I should elaborate as to what I mean by this. In the PC gaming world, where 3D is actually most dominant, what happens is the majority of video games are programmed for traditional 2D displays. And then software, or middleware software, extrapolates what the 3D should look like. It's not quite 2D to 3D conversion, because there actually is a second camera, but it's, it's an artificially placed second camera. So the, the game is doing something that it wasn't originally intended to do. So in this case, I'm showing samples from the DDD Triad, or Dynamic Digital Depth, as well as, a, a, in one or two cases, from NVIDIA's 3D Vision as well. So let's make sure your glasses are on, and let me explain what's happening in this, in this clip. So this is a game, uh, Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, very popular. They inadvertently made a really good stereoscopic 3D game. It wasn't intended to be that way, it just turned out to be a fantastic game for this purpose. On the left-hand side, it, you know, it, it may look a little wonky, okay? What's happening is, it's a 2D, then it's gradually going to 3D, and back to 2D. So it's like, a, imagine my hands going apart and close together. On the right-hand side is the, is the actual source. It's the side-by-side -side image. Now what I want you to see, it, it, you may want to take the glasses off just so you can see it, is that the separation is happening equal, equally in both eyes. So the left eye is moving to the left, right eyes moving to the right, and they're going center at the same time. So both eyes are separating at the same time. Okay, so far so good. Now, what happens when we try to aim? Let's see. There we go. Okay, I'm using the in-game crosshair, and uh, I'm not hitting the guy. I seem to be pointing at where it's supposed to go. Take out with those snakes. Take out with those snakes. <laughs> not very good. So, um, no, so that, that's, a, that's a big problem. If you can't aim properly in, in stereoscopic 3D, you're, you're not going to have a good time. Now, here's an example of, of the map from Company of Heroes. Now, I've got these soldiers on the map. Shake a leg, people! Now, you, you should see... Here, I just want to see I'm not bringing up this myself. Is there's a mouse cursor moving around, and they're going to where the mouse cursor is. But if we look carefully, the, the circle where the where that mouse cursor is isn't matched up with the mouse cursor. Now this is very simple. There's nothing complicated happening in the game. But if, if you can imagine this map filled with soldiers and buildings and having to work very quickly to, to get things in the right place, you're not going to game very well. So this is a serious problem that, that has to be taken care of when it comes to games and so, how to summarize, even with the basic 3D premise, if, if the game's just translated to 3D as is, 
We're going to have a problem with crosshairs and aiming techniques being ineffective, and of course with maps picking and choosing items on, on menus and so on, it's going to be problematic. So how do we get the interface to work in stereoscopic 3D? So there's a number of solutions. First is a driver add-on, and we'll see, I don't know if you could see it. You should see a yellow dot. You should see a yellow dot next to the game crosshair. Okay, this is something that's inserted, in this case, by the DDD stereoscopic 3D driver. The dot is rendered at the depth of the object that's being pointed at. So if we look on the right-hand side, or actually both sides, really, the, the firewalls are going where they're supposed to. Now, uh, so this works really well for first-person shooters. It's also good for what I call reticule-based simulators. So, for example, if you're in a, a fighter jet and you've got a heads-up display, there, there should be like a targeting crosshair you use for your, you know, your gunfire or your weapon. So, similar idea, and this would work well for that as well. Unfortunately, it's not good for 3D maps because this add-on crosshair is, is, is designed for just that. It's not intended as a, a mouse cursor that moves all over the screen. Another issue, and you should put your glasses on for this, this is from Battlefield 3. And what it is, it's actually a stereoscopic 3D rendering of the gun. The, the, the game itself, this is actually like this, and I'll explain why a little later in the presentation. But what you should see is there's clearly a conflict. I mean, the, game, the gun itself is rendered in 3D, so the rear of the gun is getting in the way of the front of the gun. And if you were to add this add-on crosshair, there wouldn't be room. You can't really look through the scope. So this is a this is this is a problem that, needs, that uh, game developers or driver developers need to get around. Now, here's another option. We learned earlier in this presentation about you know 80% of us are dominant in, in our right eye, the remaining 20% in the left. So what we can do is we can. There's technology available today that they, they could use your dominant eye for aiming and still maintaining the in-game crosshair. And I'll explain how it works later, but if we look at this segment from, from Elder Scrolls, you can see that uh, I, I'm aiming correctly in the right side, on the left and the right, when the, where the fireballs are going. In the right side, you see the fireballs hitting target. On the left-hand side, it, it, you know, it, it, it's got nothing to do with the with the crosshair. So this is just a demonstration that indeed it's the right eye or the dominant eye that really matters. And now Company of Heroes, this is a similar situation. If we look carefully at the mouse, uh, the mouse pointer, it's ending right spot on into the, the marker. So you see that circle that just appeared? In your right eye, it's appearing correct, but if you were open just your left eye or the other, the eye that's not dominant, you'd see that it's incorrect. So again, only your dominant eye really matters when it comes to aiming, and you can, of course, enjoy the game. Now, these dominant eye mechanisms work really well for, again, first-person shooters, in this case, 3D maps, so what the company of heroes, this is like a 3D map example, or an RTS game, and uh, simulator ridicules, like jet fighters, and so on. Now, here's another benefit. This is, again, from Battlefield 3. If we, if you keep both your eyes open, Assuming that your right eye is the dominant eye, it should look like the, the, you should see a bullet hole right through the scope. But if you open just your left eye, the, the gun is pointed in the wrong direction, it's got nothing to do with where the bullet goes. But here's an example where we could have a fully rendered stereoscopic 3D gun without this, this, this conflict. So this works very well for, for gun scopes. Now how does it work? So this is, uh, it's really uh, kind of neat. If you look again on your left-hand side, you've got the 3D image. On the right-hand side, do you remember when I mentioned earlier that both sides are separating at the same time? You, you may want to take your glasses off so you can see this clearly. On the right hand, let's just say your right eye is the dominant eye, it's perfectly still. So that eye is accurate 100% of the time. But the separation and all the 3D adjustments, or the stereoscopic 3D adjustments, I should say, is happening in your left eye. So that's where all the action is happening. So uh, in the case of the DDD drivers, you can choose whether your left eye dominant or right eye dominant, so that chooses what, it, what happens. But the benefit of this is you can use the in-game heads-up display and the in-game effects and benefit from a dominant eye. Now, this, by the way, this technique was first introduced by IC3D a few years ago. 
So we've known about this for, for some time. Now, um, there is a trade-off, though. This is an image from Battlefield 3 using the dominant eye system. And what we should see is, even though the game's crosshair is accurate, look at the name tags on top of the soldiers. They're not rendered at the depth of the soldiers themselves. They're rendered at screen depth, as though they're, you know, they're just kind of floating there. So this is, it works. Uh, you know, gamers can enjoy their games in 3D. It's, it, it is a minor trade-off in, in the case of a good crosshair. But, um, you know, it, it would be optimal to have everything rendered at their proper depth. Also, because of the way the, te the way the technique works, where one side is perfectly still and the other side is what's separating and being adjusted, some gamers have said that it's an uncomfortable technique for them because it's a, it's a bit unnatural. Most are okay with it, but some have noted that it's a bit uncomfortable. And this is finally uh, the ultimate solution so far. This is the need of rendering of Battlefield 3. In this case, it was running through uh, uh, the NVIDIA 3D Vision. Uh, if we look carefully, you'll see that the crosshair is at the correct depth, the name tags are at the correct depth, everything has a, you know, a proper 3D element to it. So that's, you know, that in theory should be optimal. But um, there are still some challenges. So even with the native crosshair, if you have out of screen effects with close objects, it, it could be very challenging. It could be actually near impossible to aim. Also, do you remember when I showed earlier about the scope that didn't look right in 3D? Uh, well, that would be true here as well. So what some game developers do to get around this problem is they actually render the game in 2D instead of stereoscopic 3D. So they treat it as like a flat object, which kind of goes against the, the purpose of, of doing things in 3D. So that's kind of a trade-off there. And of course, to get this, um, to get the objects and the name tags at the right depth, it requires the game developer to do this on purpose. They have to know that their game is eventually going to be in stereoscopic 3D. So it does require game developer care. Now, what if the crosshair was 100% dominant, but the game's 3D rendering is traditional? We're going to have to find that out later. I don't have a slide for that. I haven't, done, I haven't had the opportunity to actually test something like that out yet. So what does this mean for you? And when I say you, uh, I'm thinking display makers or, or panel makers. Well, the things that, uh, my experience at least, is that we have to keep the ghosting and crosstalk to a minimum. This is the bleed through between the left and right eye. Because it, it will harm the crosshair accuracy in video games. It could create confusion where there should be none. Also, if we're talking about panels and displays, you know, a question I ask myself is, will touching the 3D display ruin the interface? If you're starting blocking the left and right eye with your hands, will that affect where the crosshair replacement is? And also, what's the impact of head movement on accuracy? I mean, playing video games is an exciting thing, and if you're moving your head around and that impacts things, that could be uh, problematic. So, at this time, for glasses-based 3D televisions and displays, these tend to be the most advantageous for gamers right now, for the living room or for the desktop. Because if things are, are done properly, movements won't interfere with the 3D image and, or, or the crosshair effectiveness. Polarized solutions used to be uh, more sensitive than they are now, so I almost put them in the same category. I've seen some new stuff which adds a lot of uh, flexibility with head movement. And also the ghosting and the crosstalk is minimal, so these are all benefits that, you know, you, a lot of complain about the glasses, but the, the truth is, uh, you know, glasses-based displays are, are very beneficial for gamers. Now for mobile 3D displays and games, they tend to be uh, based on parallax barrier technology. They're limited to sweet spot viewing. And with too much uh, head movement, cro the, the crosshair and interface accuracy is uh, immediately lost. So using, uh, and also using the screen with your fingers can get in the way of the actual image. So these are all things that work against gaming with mobile 3D displays. So the solutions are uh, to avoid using the gyroscope for, the, for interface purposes. So when I say the gyroscope, you could actually move your smartphone or your tablet around and the game to pick up that movement uh, and treat it as your interface, whether you're turning right, left, accelerating, and so on. So uh, instead of doing that, some game developers are using, they call them screen pads, where they draw these circles on the game's image and use your thumbs to control it. So you could, you know, keep the 3D image whole. Uh, and in one case, for the Nintendo 3DS, 
they got around the problem altogether, where they created a second um, display, which is strictly in 2D for interface purposes, and they leave the, the glasses free or the autostereoscopic display untouched, so the, the interface is always clean. And just, you know, this is interesting, I discovered this with the Nintendo 3DS, they use different crosshair techniques depending on the game being played. So standard games, they use a, a native crosshair, which was what I showed earlier with Battlefield, where everything's rendered at the right depth and so on. But for augmented reality games, where they use the 3DS's camera to pick up the room, and the room is part of the game, and you're moving your, your, your 3DS all over the place to play the game and shooting with your triggers, they use the dominant line crosshair so that it doesn't fall apart when you're, you're playing your games in 3D, or at least it cuts that, that problem down. So uh, just a heads up, uh, I, I work with a, a research initiative called iGo3D, and one of the things that we're researching, amongst other things when it comes to stereoscopic 3D gaming, uh, is, is crosshair development, and it's uh, crosshairs in 3D games. And it's funded in part by OMNIC, or Ontario Media Development Corporation, and the Ontario, Ontario Centers of Excellence, basically the Ontario government. And uh, you know, our full results will be available in August of, of this year. And uh, among others, with partners are like Electronic Arts, Big Bubble, Digital Extremes, uh, a number of universities, University of Ontario Institute of Technology. So it, 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 you should actually check out the website at igo3d.ca. But more than that, if there is a problem to solve, or you're interested in 3D gaming and you want some research done to better the look of games on your displays, you should contact us because we're, we're looking and investigating ways to do another round of this, this important research. So uh, one, one more uh, point for you is, uh, here's a scary thought, um, if 3D gaming interfaces are designed for 80% of people, what do the other 20% see? So uh, thanks for watching, bring the lights up. Um, oh, just one more point. In the description for today's discussion, it's like this sentence ended, like, like that's where UGA is setting up a press steering team to do, and then it goes blank. So what we are doing is uh, the media is getting together to come up with the testing and review standards for 3D displays and 3D software products. So it's very exciting stuff, and of course the industry is welcome to participate with that. And that's it, so thank you. If you have any questions, by all means.